from the SiliconANGLE Media office in Boston, Massachusetts. It's the Cube. Now, here's your host, Dave Vellante. Hi, everybody. This is Dave Vellante, and this is the Cube, the leader in live tech coverage. This Cube conversation, I'm really excited. Craig Hibbert is here. He's vice president of Infinidat, and he focuses on strategic accounts. He's been in the storage business for a long time. He's got great perspectives. Craig, good to see you again. Thanks for coming on. Good to see you, Dave. Good to be back. So there's a there's a saying, don't fight fashion. Well, you guys fight fashion all the time. You got these patents, you got this thing called Neurocash, yeah. your, your founder and, and chairman, uh, uh, Moshe, has always been sort of cutting against the grain and doing things his own way. But I'd love for you to talk about some of those things, the patents that you have, sure. the architecture, the Neurocash. Fill us in on all that. Sure, so uh, it, when we go in, we talk to customers and we say we have 138 patents, a lot of them say, well that's great, but you know, how does that relate to me? A lot of these are and or gates and certain things, they don't know how it fits into the day-to-day -day life. So I think this is a good opportunity to talk about several of those that do. And so obviously the neural cache is something that is, is dynamic instead of having a key and a hash, which all the other vendors have, uh, just our position in that table um, uh, allows us to determine all the values and things we need from it. But it also monitors, this is a, an astounding statement, but from the moment that array is powered on, every IO that flows through it, we track data for the life of the array. And for some of these customers, it's five and six years. So, you know, are those blocks of data, are they random? Are they sequential? Are they hot? Are they cold? When was the last time it was accessed? And this is key information because we, we bring intelligence to the lower level block layer where everybody else is just dumb. They just ship things, things come into a queue and they move them, they have no idea what they are. We do. And the value around that is that we can then predict when workloads are aging out. Um, today you have manual people writing things in, in uh, things like easy tier or, or fast or, or, or competing products, a tiered storage manager, and all these things that, that manage all of these profiles with a human intervention. We do it dynamically and that feeds information back into the array and helps it determine which virtual array group it should reside on and where on the, the disk spindles based upon the age of the, uh, of the application, how it's trending. Th these are very powerful things in a, in a day where we need imminent information sent into a consumer in a store, right? It's all, all of this dynamic processing and the ability to, to bring that in. So that's, that's one of the things we do. Another one is that's the catalyst for our fast rebuilds. Um, we can rebuild two failed full 12 terabyte drives in under 18 minutes. If those drives are half full, then it's nine minutes. And this is by uh, understanding where all the data is and sharing the rebuild process from the drives. That's another one of our patterns. Perhaps one of the most challenging that we have is that um, storage vendors tend to do error correction at the fiber channel layer. Once that data enters into the storage array, there is no mechanism uh, to check the integrity of that data. And a couple of vendors have an option uh, to do this, but they can only do it for the first write. And they also recommend you turn that feature off because it slows down the box. So where Infinidat is unique, and I think this is for me one of the, the, the most important patterns that we have, is that every time we write a 64K slice uh, in the system, we assign some metadata to that. And obviously it has a, a CRC checksum, but more importantly, it has the locality of reference. So if we subsequently go back and do a reread, and the CRC matches, but the, the location has changed, we know that corruption has happened. Something's a bit flipped, torn right, all of these things that constitute sound data corruption. That's not just the impressive part. What we do at that point is we dynamically deduce that the data's been corrupted and using the parity in the quorum, we're, at, we're at, um, a, a RAID 6, like a dual parity uh, um, a configuration, we rebuild that data on the fly without the application um, or the end user knowing that there was a problem and that way serve back the data that was actually written. We guarantee that. We're the only array that does that uh, today. It's massive for our customers. Yeah, I mean, the time to rebuild, you said a 12 terabyte drive. I mean, I, yeah. I, I, I would have thought, I mean, they always joke, how, how long do you think it takes to rebuild a 30 terabyte drive? Because eventually, you know, it's sure. getting there. It's like a month. With, with us, it's the same. So if you look at our three terabyte drives, it was 18 minutes. The four terabyte drives, 18 minutes. The six, 18 minutes. Eight, 12, we'll be good all the way up to the 28 terabyte drives of the configuration we have. Now I want to come back to a conversation we've had many, many times with sure. you guys. Uh, we were early on in, in the flash storage trend and we saw the prices coming down. We mm -hmm. felt like high speed spinning disks were, their days were numbered and sure. we were, Correct in that uh, prediction, uh, but then, you know, disk drives have kept that distance. Yep. Um, you guys have a skewed going all flash because the economics. Mm -hmm. um, but it, help us understand this because you've got this mechanical device, mm -hmm. and you, yet you guys are able to claim performance that's 
equal to or oftentimes much, much better than a lot of your all-flash competitors. And I want to understand that a little bit. It suggests to me that there's so much other overhead going on and other bottlenecks in mm -hmm. the system that you guys are dealing with both architecturally and through your intelligence software. Can you talk about that a little absolutely, bit? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, the software is the key, right? We are a software company and we have uh, some phenomenal guys that, that, that do the software piece. So um, as far as the performance goes, the, the back-end spin in DIS are really obfuscated by two layers of virtualization. Um, and we ensure that because we have massive amounts of DRAM that all of that data flows into DRAM. Uh, it will sit in DRAM for an astonishing five minutes. I say astonishing because most of our vendors try to evict cash straight away so they've got room for the next one. And that does not facilitate a mechanism by which you can inspect um, those dumb pieces of data. And if you get enough dumb data, you can start to make it intelligent, right? You can go get discarded data from cell phone towers and find out you know, wh where people go to work and what time they work. And because of that, what demographic are they in? And you, you know, now you're predicting the election based upon discarded <laughs> cell phone tower data. So, um, so if you can take dumb data and put patterns around it, um, and, and make it sequential, which we do, we write out in a log structured right. So we're really, really fast at the front end, and some customers say, well, how do you manage that on the back end? Here's something that our, our designers and architects did very, very well. Uh, the, the speed of, the, of DDR3 is about 15 gig per second, which is what's in DRAM right now. Uh, we have 480 spindles on the back end. If you say each one of them can do a, a 100, 100 meg per second, which they can do more than that, they can do about 200. That gives us a 48 gigabit, uh, gigabyte sorry, per second uh, uh, backplane destage ability, which is three times faster than the DRAM. So when you look at it, the box has been designed all the way so there is no bottleneck through th flowing through the DRAM, uh, anything that's still been accessed that comes out of that five minute window once it's destaged to all the spindles, incidentally in the log structured right. So we're right now at over 480 spindles all the time. Um, and then you've got the random still on the SSD which will help to, to, to keep that response time around about uh, two milliseconds. And just one last point on that, I have a customer that has 1.2 petabytes written on a 1.38 petabyte box and is still achieving a two millisecond a second response time. And that's unheard of because most block arrays, as you fill them up to 60, 70 percent, the, the performance starts going in the tank. So I got to go down memory lane here. So the most successful you know, uh, uh, storage array in the history of the industry, you know, my opinion, probably fact, was Symmetrix. And mm -hmm. when Moshe designed that, he eschewed uh, RAID 5. Everybody mm -hmm. was on the crazy about RAID 5. He said, no, 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 we'll just mirror it. Yep. Um, and that's going to give us you know, the, the, the performance that we need. And he would write, they would write to, to DRAM, mm -hmm. and then, then of course, you'd think that the D stage bandwidth was the bottleneck, mm -hmm. but because they had such a back, high, a, a, a large number of back end spindles, mm -hmm. the bandwidth coming out of that DRAM was enormous. You just described something actually quite similar, so that I was going to ask you, isn't the D stage bandwidth the bottleneck? And you're saying no, because your D stage bandwidth is actually Three higher times greater. than the DRAM. Yep, it is. So with the symmetrics and typical platforms, you would have a, a, a certain amount of disks in a disk group, and you would assign FAs and fiber channel ports to that, and there'd be certain segments in cache that were dedicated to those disks. We have done away with that. We have so many, well, we have two layers of the virtualization at the front, as we talked about, um, but because nothing is a bottleneck, and because we've optimized each component the DRAM, and I talked about the SSDs, we don't write um, um, uh, heavily over those, we write in a sequential pattern to the SSDs so that the wear rate is, is elongated. And so because of that, and we have all of the virtualized uh, RAID groups configured in cache. So what happens is, is as we get to that five minute window we're about to destage, all of the RAID groups, the algorithms are telling the cache how to lay out the virtual RAID structure based on how busy other RAID groups are at the time. So if you were to pause it and ask us where it's going, we can tell you it's the machine learning, it's the artificial intelligence that's saying this RAID group just took a, a, a destage, you know, or, or there's a lot of data in the cache that's heading for these based upon the, uh, the, the prediction of the hot, the cold that I talked about a few months months ago, and so it will make a determination to use a different virtual ratio, and that's all done in memory as opposed to, to rely on the disk. So we're not, we don't have the, uh, the concept of spare disk, we have the concept of spare capacity, it's all shared, and because it's all shared, it's this very powerful uh, pool that just doesn't get bogged down and continues to operate all the way up to the full capacity. Of the so I, I'm, I'm struggling with this, there is no bottleneck, because there, uh, uh, there's always a bottleneck in the sure. system, so where is the bottleneck? The, the bottleneck for us is when the array is full. So if you overwrite the maximum bandwidth, um, and that historically, uh, you know, in, in, in 2016, 2017 was a, a roughly 12 gig per second, we upped that in the fall of 2018 to around about 15, and uh, we're about to make the announcement that uh, we've made tectonic increases in that, where 
will now have write bandwidth approaching 16 gig per second uh, uh, and also uh, read bandwidth about 25 gig per second. That 16 is going to move up to 20. Remember what I said, we release a number and we gradually grow into it and, and, and maximize and tweak that software. When you think that most uh, all flash arrays can do maybe one and a half uh, gig per second sustained writes, that gives us a massive leg up over our competition. And instead of buying uh, an all-flash array for this and, a, and another mid-tier array for this and cold storage for this, you can just buy one platform that services it all, all the protocols, uh, and they're all accessed the same way. So you write an API one way. Uh, Mark Shuttleworth is a big fan of this about writing code, obviously with Spinnaker and some of those other things that he's been involved mm -hmm. in. Uh, we do the same thing. So it's, it, our API is the same for the block as it is for the NAS, as it is for the iSCSI. So it's, it's, it's very consistent. You write it once and you can adapt multiple products. I want to pick your brain about customers for, sure. for a bit. Everybody talks about digital transformation and mm -hmm. it's this big buzzword, but when you talk to customers, they're all going through some kind of digital transformation or they want to get digital right, let's put it that way. Yep. They don't want to get disrupted. They see Amazon buying grocers yeah. and Apple getting into financial services and content and it's all about the data. It is. So there's a real disruption scenario going on for, for every business. Um, and, and the innovation engine seems to be data, okay, but data just sitting there in a, in a data swamp is no good, so you got to yep. apply machine intelligence for that, to that data, and you got to have scale. Mm -hmm. So you guys make a big deal about, about petabyte scale. Yep. What are your customers telling you about the importance of that, and how does it fit into that innovation sandwich that I just laid out? Sure, no, it's a great question. So uh, we have some very big customers, some have 70 petabytes of production. 70? Uh, with us, 70, yep. Uh, we have a couple of those, uh, both financial institutions, um, uh, very, very good at what they do. Um, we worked with them uh, previously with, a, with another product that really kind of introduced, another one of Moshe's products that was XIV, that introduced the concept of self-healing and no tuning and things like that. We haven't even talked about that, that there's no tuning knobs on the Infinidat, uh, probably should mention that. Um, but our customers said, have said to us, we couldn't scale. You know, we had a couple hundred terabyte boxes before that were okay. You know, you've brought, you've raised the game by bringing a much higher level of, of availability and much higher capacity. We can take one of our, but I'm in this process right now with a customer, we can take one of our boxes and collapse three uh, VMAX 20 or VMAX 40s on it. We, we have in, in numerous occasions gone into establishments that have 11, 12, 23 inch cabinets, two and a half thousand spindles of the old DMC VMAX days and we've replaced it with one 19 inch rack of ours. Right, the, uh, that's a phenomenal statement when you think about it, and that was paid for. You think some of these VMAX 40s have up to 192 ports on them, fiber channel ports. Uh, we have 24. So the fiber channel port reduction, the power heating and cooling over an entire row down to one eight kilowatt consumption. By the way, our power is the same, whether it's three, four terabyte, six, eight, 12, they all use the same power plant. So as we increase the geometry capacity of the drives, we decrease the cost per usable. Well, we're actually far more efficient than an all flash array. We're the most environmentally friendly um, hybrid spinning disk planet uh, on, the, on the array. So I asked you about cloud. So uh, disk array on the planet, that would be. Sorry. Yeah, so when cloud first sort of came into the, the into vision, Financial services guys were like, no, cloud is a, yeah. is a bad word. They're, they're definitely you know, leaning into that, adopting it more, but still, there's a lot of workloads that they're going to leave on-prem. They want to bring mm -hmm. that cloud experience to, to the data. What are you hearing from the financial services customers in particular? And I, and I single them out because they're, they're very sure. advanced, they're very demanding, they are. and they get a lot of dough. Um, and so, what do you see in terms of them building cloud, hybrid cloud, um, and, and, and what it means uh, for for them and specifically the storage industry. Yeah, so I'm actually surprised that they've adopted it as much as they have, to be mm -hmm. honest with you, and I think the the uh, the economics are driving that. But having said that, whenever they want to get the data back or they want to bring it back on-prem for various reasons, that's when they're running into to problems, right? It's, it's like, how do I get my own data back? Well, you've got to open up the checkbook and write big checks. So I think Infinidat has a nice strategy there where we have um, the same capabilities that you have on-prem, you have in the cloud. And don't forget, nobody else has that. One of the encumbrances to people moving moving to the cloud has been that it lacks the enterprise functionality that people are used to in the data center. But because our cost point is so affordable, we become not only very attractable for on-prem, but for cloud solutions as well. And of course, we have our own uh, Nutrix cloud offering, which allows people to use it as DR or, or replication as a server, however you want to do it, where you can use the same APIs and code that you run in your data center and extrapolate that out to the cloud, obviously, which is, which is very uh, uh, helpful. 
And so we have the ability, if you take a snapshot on Amazon, uh, it may take four hours and, it, and it's been uh, copied over to an S3 device. That's the only way they can make it affordable to do it. And then if you need that data back, it's, it's, not, it's not imminent. You've got to rehydrate from S3 and then copy it back over your snapshot. With Infinidat, it's instantaneous. We do not stop I.O. when we do snapshots. Another one of the patterns. We use a time synchronous mechanism. Every, every I.O. that arrives has a timestamp. And we, when we take a snapshot, we just do a point in time. And, and, and any timestamp that's greater than that instantiation point is, is, is for the volume. And, and previous is for the snapshot. We can do that in the cloud. We can instantly recover hundreds of terabytes worth of databases and make them instantly available. So our story, again, with the innovation, our innovation wasn't just for, for on-prem, it was to be facilitated anywhere you are. And that same price point carries forward from here into the cloud. When Amazon and Microsoft wake up and realize that we have this phenomenal story here, I think they'll be buying from us in, in leaps and bounds. It's, it's the only way to make the cloud affordable for storage vendors. So the interesting thing is you talk about you know, bringing bringing data back, mm -hmm. bringing workloads back. And, and there are tool chains that are now yep. on-prem, that Kubernetes is a great example, yep. um, that are cloud-like. And mm -hmm. so when you bring data back, you want to have that cloud experience. So automated operations plays into that. You know, automation used to be something that people were afraid of. Mm -hmm. They want to do, do manual tiering. Remember, they wanted their own knobs to turn. Those days are gone because yep. people want to drive digital transformations. They don't want to spend time doing all this heavy lifting. Can you talk about right. that a little bit and where you guys fit? Yeah, I mean, you know, I say to my customers too, uh, not to knock our competition, but you can't have a service processor as the intercommunication point between what the customer wants and it deciding when it's going to talk to the array and configure. It's got to be instantaneous. And so we all we have, we don't have any job we don't have any flash, we don't have any host, we don't have uh, uh, massive servers around the data center collecting information. We just have an HTML5 interface. And so our time to deployment is very, very quick. When we land on the customer's dock, the box goes in, we hook up the power, we put the drives in. We, I hate to use the word VTOC because it brings back bad memories for a lot of customers. Volume table of uh, contents yeah, for I, those I, who aren't. You know, as right, as now we're going back in time, <laughs> right? Knowing that main here. Um, and so we're very dynamic both in how we forward face the customers, but also on the back end for ourselves. We eat our own dog food in the sense that we are, uh, we have an automation team. We've automated our migration from non infinite app platforms to us. That uses some level of, of artificial intelligence. Um, we've also built a lot of parameters around uh, things like going with ServiceNow and, and, and customers. It's because you can do with our API what other people take, you know, page and page of code. I'll give you an example. One of our customers uh, said, I need uh, OCI, uh, the, the, the NetApp management product and we called NetApp and they said, hey listen, you know, it usually takes six months to get an appointment and then it takes at least six months to do the code. And we said, no, 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 we're not like any other storage render. We don't have all these silly RAID groups and spare disk capacity and all this. We we three commands we can show in the API and we showed them and they're like, wow, can you send us an array? We said, no, we can do something better. We were designed SDS. Right? When, when Infinidat was coded, there was no hardware. And the reason we did that is because soft, software developers will always code to the level of resilience of the hardware. So if you take away that hardware, the software developers have to code to make something to withstand any type of hardware that comes in. And at the end of the coding process, that's when we started bringing in the hardware pieces. So we were written SDS, we can send vendors and customers a, an OVA, a virtual appliance of our box. They were able to do the, in a week, they told the customer we have to go through full QA, no reason why it wouldn't work and they did it for us and got it. And it was a massive customer of theirs and ours. That's a powerful story. The time to deployment for your homegrown apps, as well as things like ServiceNow and OCI, incredible with Infinidat. Three API calls, we were done. So you guys had a little shadow partnership with NetApp in the field, essentially. We did, yeah, I mean, it was great. They, they, they had a, a massive license with this particular customer. Uh, they wanted our storage on the platform, and we worked uh, very, very quickly with them. They were very accommodating. Uh, we'd love to get our storage qualified behind their, uh, uh, behind their heads right now for another customer as well. So, yeah, there, there's definitely some synergy there. People realize what we have. Uh, Splunk's massive for us. What we're able to do with Splunk in one box, uh, people, uh, competitive just can't do in a row. Um, so, it, so it's very compelling what we actually bring in, how we do it, and that, that API level is, is incredibly powerful, and we're utilizing that ourselves. I would like to see some integration uh, with Canonical. Uh, uh, Mark Shuttleworth and his guys have done a, a great job with SDS plays. Um, we'd like to bring that here, do Spinnaker, do Galactic Fog, do some of those things uh, as well that we're working on with the automation team. We just added, added another employee, another FTE to the automation team in Infinidat. So we do these and we engage with customers and we help you get out of that trench that is antiquity and move forward into the, you know, in, into the vision of how you do one thing well and it, and it permeates to the cloud, on-prem, off-prem, hybrid. 
all those kind of well, things. that API philosophy that you have and that infrastructure as code model that you just yep. described allows you to build out your your ecosystem in a really facile way. So, Greg, thanks so much for thanks. coming on Thank and, you. Uh, and doing that double click with us. Really appreciate it. I'd love to have you back. Great, thanks a lot, Dave. All right, thank You're you. Welcome. Thank you for watching. You're watching the Cube. This is Dave Vellante. We'll see you next time. <laughs>